In this video, we're going to introduce the idea of confirmation, and particularly representations of confirmation. Confirmation refers to this level of organic structure involving rotations around single bonds. Because single bonds are made from the coaxial or head-on overlap of orbitals, rotation about a single bond doesn't break it. So rotation tends to be very rapid and very easy at typical temperatures where we deal with organic compounds. And here we're talking about you know, any normal temperature where you would see a reaction, even something like negative 78 degrees Celsius, rotation around a single bond is still going to be very rapid. Structures that are related by rotation about one or more single bonds are known as conformations. And conformations can have different energies. And this is the main reason we're interested in exploring conformation and the energetic dependence of rotation around a single bond. All right, so in order to represent and think about and describe that dependence of energy on the rotational state of a molecule, we need first of all to know how can we represent and describe different conf conformations. Of course we could do this using wedge and dash structures, and this is sometimes done. But this is a little bit cumbersome because rotation is a bit difficult to detect in a wedge dash structure. Every time we rotate, the wedges and dashes are going to change. And so what we often do is actually move the entire molecule and assume a perspective where the rotation and what's different between two structures related by a rotation is much more clear. From a perspective like this, it's very easy for us to tell when the front carbon has rotated with respect to the back. This, by the way, is an operation that we're going to call torsion, like wringing out a towel, rotating one side of a towel with respect to the other. It's known as bond torsion in a molecular context. And the two most common projections that are used to emphasize and represent conformation are the sawhorse and Newman projections. And both of these involve turning the wedge dash structure kind of on its side. With the sawhorse projection, we kind of don't go all the way, right? So this bond is not perfectly perpendicular to the screen, but it's at an angle to the screen with these three hydrogens, this CH3 group, closer to you than this CH3 group, or vice versa, actually, depending on your your perspective. My sense is always the lower left is closer to me and the back top right is uh, and the top right is farther away from me, but you may see this a slightly different way. For our purposes, these are equivalent representations. And then there's the Newman projection where we rotate the bond, we move the bond of interest perpendicular to the screen and look down that bond and represent that bond as a big circle. So here, if we're interested in rotations about this central carbon-carbon bond, which we would be in ethane, then we're going to, in the Newman projection, represent that bond as a big circle. And we see that this carbon is in the front with its three CH bonds fully visible. And the CH bonds that are in the back, we know are in the back in the Newman projection because they're not fully visible. They're behind the circle. And so these are back behind our bond of interest. And so this particular Newman projection comes from assuming a viewpoint from this side of the molecule, like so. We'll dig into Newman projections in a bit more detail here in a second. For now, the point I want to make is these representations emphasize rotations around that central bond. If, for example, I rotate the front carbon with respect to the back carbon, all of these hydrogens are going to move pretty dramatically. And we can see that very easily using a Newman projection. So as we just mentioned, a Newman projection is a view of an organic compound looking down a bond of interest. So we rotate the molecule so that our bond of interest is perpendicular to the screen so that we can very easily see torsions. And you're going to want to be able to translate a wedge dash representation with particular locations for the groups on wedges and dashes into a Newman projection. And this slide shows two examples of how to do this. In both cases, we're going to imagine looking at the molecule from the left-hand side. This is kind of an arbitrary choice. We've got to choose our viewpoint first. And it's common to do this from the left-hand side. Uh, this is entirely an arbitrary choice. If it makes more sense to you to look at this from the right-hand side, you might try generating that Newman projection on your own. It's going to look very similar to this, just with the coloring and the orientations of groups a little bit different. But in any event, we're looking at this molecule from the left-hand side. That means this carbon with the red hydrogens is closer to us. So in the Newman projection, this carbon and its three hydrogens appears in the front. 
and this carbon and its three hydrogens appears in the back. And notice we can't quite see those CH bonds in the back. Now, the other thing to notice here is that the bonds are what we'll call staggered in the front and back. The front and back CH bonds alternate as we move in a circular motion around the Newman projection. This in the front, this in the back, front, back, front, back. This is what's known as a staggered conformation, and it follows from the orientations in the wedge dash projection. Notice, for example, at the back carbon, the three CH bonds form the shape of the letter Y, whereas the front CH bonds form an inverted or upside down Y. And that's exactly what we see in the Newman projection. Upside down Y here, and right side up Y is implied in the back. If we rotate the back CH bonds slightly, if we rotate about the single bond to move those CH bonds slightly, we get this structure at the bottom. And this is known as eclipsed. In the eclipsed structure, the front and back CH bonds are exactly aligned. And we can see that, for example, in the wedge dash projection here. These front and back CH bonds are exactly aligned. And we represent that in the Newman projection by just slightly sort of canting one of either the front or back carbon here. The back carbon is slightly canted so that we can see the groups that are back there, even though we, we know that they're meant to be eclipsed. They're meant to be sitting directly on top of one another. So for example, this CH bond and this CH bond are directly aligned. That's why this is known as an eclipsed conformer. And here again, we've got the, car, the red CH bonds in the front and we've got the blue CH bonds in the back, and this was based on our choice of looking at the molecule from this side. Let's practice converting a wedge dash projection into a Newman projection from a given orientation of the observer. So here, we're looking at this molecule from this perspective, and the first thing we want to do is, well, first of all, identify our bond of interest. It's this bond. This is going to be the big circle in the Newman projection, and we want to sort of create a template out of the orientation of the molecule, not adding the groups just yet, but understanding, for example, whether the front carbon should look like a Y or an inverted Y, and whether we're dealing with a staggered or eclipsed situation. And to do that, it's very, very helpful, and I strongly, strongly recommend drawing in the implied hydrogens at any carbons involved in the bonds. So I've gone ahead and done that here. Notice that here we have a wedged chlorine, and so this hydrogen should be dashed, and it should be next to that wedged chlorine so that we get our nice heart situation here with the wedge and dash. And at the other carbon, we had a dashed chlorine. This implies a wedged hydrogen next to that dashed chlorine, where again, we draw them next to each other to get this nice heart-shaped situation that uh, is a realistic depiction of the tetrahedral geometry. Okay, now we can generate a template Newman projection, recognizing, for instance, that these three groups form the shape of a Y. So at the front carbon, we should see a right side up Y. And at the back carbon, we've got an upside down Y. So this is going to be a staggered conformation. And so sort of our template Newman projection looks like this. Here's our right side up Y based on the front carbon. And here's our upside down Y in the back based on that carbon that looks like an upside down Y in the wedge dash projection. Okay, now let's start adding groups. And to do this, I like to start with the in-plane groups, the groups that are in the plane without wedges and dashes. I just find this a little bit e easier to visualize. Both of these are methyl groups, or CH3s. And this CH3 at the front carbon is going to be at the bottom of the Y shape. So a methyl group is going to be there. Now for the wedged and dashed groups, well, if I'm looking at the molecule from this way, this chlorine is going to appear on my right-hand side, and this hydrogen on my left-hand side. And so the red chlorine, first of all, is going to be in the front, and it's going to be on the right, and the H that's attached to that front carbon is going to be on the left. Pause right now and verify visually that this translates into this front carbon of the Newman projection. All right, now let's move to the back carbon. Again, sticking with the in-plane bond or group first. That's this CH3 right here. That's going to be at the top of my field of vision. Imagine you know, our observer here was wearing a hat. That's the top of his head. And so the methyl group is going to appear at this top bond. And thinking about the wedges and dashes here and here, 
the H is going to be on the right hand side and the CL on the left hand side looking from this vantage point. Again, pause if you need to, but that's going to put this H in the bottom right and the CL in the bottom left. And that's the blue CL associated with the back carbon. So here it's all about putting yourself in the observer's shoes and thinking about what you'd see in three dimensions. And if this is difficult, I strongly encourage you to pick up a model kit or use a virtual model kit so that you can move things around, build things, look at things from the angles you need to to verify the spatial relationships here and make sure that your Newman projection faithfully represents the given wedge dash projection. How do we describe conformations quantitatively and qualitatively? From the quantitative angle, we can use the angle between two bonds at adjacent carbons, an angle involving four atoms, A, B, C, and D, where what we're interested in is the angle between the bonds, A and B, and C and D. This is known as a dihedral angle or torsional angle. It's called a torsional angle because it varies with torsion. For example, if we look at this model very briefly, we can, we can see that the angle formed between this front bond and this back bond, now it's zero degrees. But if I engage this the CC bond in torsion, that angle has changed. Now it looks more like 60 degrees. This is exactly a torsional angle, the angle between these bonds. And it's a four atom situation. This atom, the carbon, the back carbon, and this back hydrogen for example, A, B, C, and D are involved in a dihedral angle or torsional angle. And Newman projections make torsional angles extremely easy to see. This is the beauty of Newman projections and why we use them when we think about conformation. So let's take, for example, our staggered conformation of ethane that we've been looking at so far. If I look at these two bonds in particular, the torsional angle associated with those two bonds is the angle between the highlighted purple sticks, which in this case, as we'll see, turns out to be 60 degrees. But if I rotate, for example, the back carbon, the, the, if I engage that back carbon in torsion and rotate the three CH bonds in the back, for example, down like this, well then the dihedral angle has changed. And this changing of the dihedral angle is what we call torsion, like wringing out a towel, right? You're changing, when you wring out a towel, you're kind of changing the dihedral angle of one side of the towel relative to the other. This is what's known as torsion. And upon this particular torsion, we've gone from a 60 degree dihedral angle between those front and back CH bonds to a dihedral angle that is more or less zero, right? Pretty much zero or close to zero in this representation. And so we can see here that the dihedral angle is very, very easy to visualize in a Newman projection since it's, it's visible as the angle between two bonds, two adjacent bonds like this. There's no need really to think in three dimensions. We can almost think in two dimensions to identify that, for example, this angle is only 60 degrees. And the torsional angle is very important for modeling the energetic dependence of conformation, how energy varies as we rotate around a bond. Because now what we can do is graph torsional angles, say on the x-axis, and graph the energy of the molecule on the y-axis and see how the molecule's energy varies with torsional angle. This is the kind of conformational analysis that we're going to work to by the end of this unit. There are also qualitative terms for particular ranges of dihedral angles, and we'll use these often when we talk about conformational aspects of reactions. For example, we'll find that an anti-periplanar arrangement of certain groups is very common. This is a dihedral angle of about 180 degrees, and using the qualitative term allows for some wiggle room in the numeric situation. It doesn't have to be exactly 180, but anti-periplanar basically means in the ballpark of 180 degrees. And we can divide up these qualitative terms using two sort of classes of terminology. Whether the bonds are close to each other or far apart is the sin anti situation. When the two bonds of interest are relatively close, the dihedral angle is relatively small, we're in a sin situation. When the dihedral angle is relatively large, we're in an anti situation. And within those classes, within those groups, if you like, we can have either clinal or peri relationships. Peri means they're almost aligned, they're almost parallel to each other, while clinal means they're almost perpendicular or they're more perpendicular to each other than parallel, if you like. 
So for example, if we imagined a hypothetical bond in the front, this say carbon R bond in the front at zero degrees, a sin periplanar arrangement is something like a 15 degree dihedral or a zero degree dihedral where this angle is relatively small. As we continue to move out, once we get past about 30 degrees, we then call that synclinal. For example, synclinal is a term we could use to um, represent the gauche conformation, which we'll come to here shortly. If we continue rotating around, we get to anticlinal, where, where now the dihedral angle is greater than 90 degrees, but not so large that we're back to peri. And once we get past about 150 degrees, then we're in the anti-peri situation, and anti-peri planar tends to refer to exactly 180 degrees, since R, C, the carbon in the back, and X are all coplanar in this particular arrangement. So you'll come across these qualitative terms from time to time to represent conformations as well.